I was about 11 when I went to England. My parents separated, and my father was never around much, but my parents separated completely. And so um, my mother took me back to Bristol in England. So I finished my education there and then came back to New Zealand. From then on, how did you get into the broadcasting side of things? Because you already, you started that over there. Yeah, yeah, well I started, I won a scholarship to drama school, and, uh, but we had no money at all, we were as poor as church mice. And so um, I started at drama school, but that was never gonna work out. I just couldn't afford to stay there, even though I had the scholarship, you know, you have to eat. So I got a job at the BBC, which was just full of a lot of frustrated actors anyway, and um, worked there for a couple of years, mostly in radio, a little yeah. bit in television, but mostly in radio, and um, was trained a bit in different areas there. Um, and then I took two years off, came back to New Zealand, worked for um, the national program, it was called yeah, then, which yeah. is now what Radio New Zealand National, um, as a producer, did a couple of other things on air, and then went back to the BBC. You worked with David Attenborough, was that? Mm, yeah. So how, how did that start? I got an attachment to what you could do at the BBC. I don't know if you still can, but what you could do then is if someone um, filled in for somebody else, they would advertise their job as an attachment. And um, sometimes the attachments would go on for years, you know, and cause mayhem. Um, and so I worked to start with, in, I was a projectionist, a cinematographer, um, in the theatre at the BBC in Bristol. And uh, I had four projectors, different format projectors. And the rushes would come in in the morning. And um, I was working mostly for the Natural History Film Unit, a couple of other programs as well. And David Attenborough would come in to watch his rushes and, and you know, complete programs. And I was very young. And this was enormously cool and very so nerve wracking. Like? Um, a little bit aloof, yeah. but hugely demanding. I mean, they, but the BBC was like that then too. Most of the people there were aloof. If you were a producer, at the BBC in those days, you were God, and you expected to be treated like God. And when people came into my little theatre, I mean, this was to watch rushes and things like that. When people would come into the theatre, they would expect curtains to open and close nicely. They would expect the lights to dim properly, um, with a few exceptions. There were the other people who, if that happened, they would blow their top. They don't have time to waste with the curtains opening and closing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you had to know your people. But they would, some of them would treat you like absolute dirt. But you, you, that was cool you treated them like they were, because that was your absolute ideal to be a producer at the BBC. But he was almost always on location. Um, so he, you know, he had a desk, I suppose, in the department, but it was a very flash department with hospitality cabinets. The measure of your quality as a broadcaster at the BBC in those days was how big your hospitality cabinet was, which is basically just a liquor fridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the BBC, it was a hospitality cabinet. A number of countries. Mm. Why did you... Did you get a travel bug or why did you want to see? I think I always have had. I've always travelled a lot. And when I worked for the BBC, I'd try and get every job possible that was overseas. And most of them were just short, short haul, you know, in Europe and things like that. Um, and then came out to New Zealand. And as soon as I was sort of established, um, I travelled as much as I could. And as a freelance foreign correspondent, um, I called myself a... Um, not a foreign correspondent, what did I call myself? Because I was working for lots of different organisations. Um, international correspondent because the, the image of a foreign correspondent is someone who's based in a foreign country, whereas I, I was just based all over the place. You know, I mean, I, my, I had an so office you, in Singapore you, yep. and an office in London, but these, I called them offices, but the office that I used in Singapore was at Changi Airport, and it was just a room that I used to rent quite often, and the office in London was one room in, in my cousin's house, um, zone, you know, zone three on the underground. Um, and then I had lived in uh, Homebush just outside of Masterton, the Wairapa. So I had like three offices where I did keep stuff, you know, permanently. So I'd watch CNN and um, try and predict where the next story was going to happen. And so would you work for whichever... Um, whoever would pay me, yeah, yeah whoever yeah. would pay. And sometimes that wasn't obvious until you were there. So it was and almost like a storm chaser, you were actually looking... Yeah, it was exactly that, yep. It was exactly that. And you'd look at, I can remember I had Algeria on my radar for a long time and I thought, you know, because I desperately wanted to go to Algeria. But a, a lot of the countries where the biggest stories are are the most expensive to get to and get around and get back from. Mother Teresa's funeral was a good example. I left from Heathrow and there was a, I think it was the Daily Mirror. Um, it could have been the Sun, I think it was the Daily Mirror and the headline was two saints die in one week. And I was sitting there reading this thinking, you know, there's something obscene about that, suggesting that Diana and Mother Teresa were both exactly. saints, in the same saints in the same light. 
And so I did this fantastic story, and that's the thing that I've most, in my career, the thing that I most enjoy is feature writing, and I haven't done very much of it. Um, but I did this, I think it was a fantastic story, um, just comparing the two. And I did it based on um, a child that had come from a, a public school in England who had paid £3.75 pence for a rose and stood in a queue for a long time to put it at Kensington Palace versus a little girl that had come out of the slums for the first time in Calcutta and had stolen a flower um, and had stood in a queue for three days in you know, like 85% humidity. She hadn't had a decent meal for her entire life just to file slowly past, past the body of um, Mother Teresa and put the flower on, on her body. And as she left, as this girl left, I was standing there. Because the media, this is the funny thing about India, the media didn't have to stand in queues or anything in India. They could go straight up oh, and right do whatever they like, um, which doesn't often happen. And, and this little girl then had to go back to the slums after this outing she had. And as she walked back, one of the missionaries of charity blessed a petal and handed her the petal and she took it back. So I did this sort of feature for The Independent in London um, on the obscenity of suggesting that Diana was a was a saint in the same light as Mother Teresa. But how well was that received? Very it badly. It was fantastic. Because, yeah. It was fantastic. There were so, so many complaints. And to their great credit, the Independent loved it. And oh, they really? sent me a letter to tell me how pleased they were with a huge number of complaints. Oh, really? You know, to suggest that week of all that Diana was no saint. Yeah. Um, but good and for them for printing it. Yeah, who the hell does he think he is? Hopefully he stays in Calcutta. So how did you end up in the Congo? Um, the Congo was um, later on, I've been a foreign correspondent for a while, and I started to, because you do more and more dangerous things, because you don't die, and I was in some really shocking situations, because again, as an individual, you have to go where the networks won't go. You get to the point where you'd have to go further than other people to get the story. So if you've got 10 people who are trying to get the story, the person that gets closer to the story, chances are, will be the one whose story is, is picked. Yeah, sure. And so I was doing some pretty dangerous things, and... Um, and just getting as close as possible, which sometimes you can do because you're on your own, that a crew could never do. You know, the BBC could never get there because, you know, you're so conspicuous, yeah, whereas one guy with a small sort of satchel with all of his broadcast equipment in it, which wasn't much in those days. Um, anyway, I decided that I'd go to the Congo because I read the story about Douglas Keir, the Hamilton, yes. the Hamilton um, guy that was on holiday over there with his wife, uh, actually in, in Kenya, and decided that he'd go and see the gorillas at a time when there was civil war. And that's another part of the world you can always depend on for a decent story. There's always some kind of civil war going on. There always seemed to have a lot of conflict. Yeah, yeah, it's a basket case, really. Um, but it's a beautiful basket case. How did you approach that story? Well, you have to... Well, intelligence is the thing. The only thing that keeps you alive is that you know more than the other people. What was your plan to free Douglas? Um, the plan to free him was just to get as close as possible and use locals um, and work on the fact that they wanted publicity. So in return for Douglas Keir, I was going to offer them publicity. So I had this idea, slightly naive, but we're all slightly naive. In any situation like that, you're, you're slightly naive at, less, at least because no one really can tell you what's going on. <clears throat> so you deal with as many locals as possible. And you can understand what the locals want and what their motivations are. I mean, it's so important. It's very complex, these situations. Because um, everyone's risking their life in a situation like that. Um, and so my idea was I would go in there with a satellite telephone and offer them publicity. And I wasn't prepared to champion their cause, but I was offering them an opportunity so that they could champion their cause um, to world media. And, and I knew that I could get it. I advertised in the local paper um, over there. So I, I had a journalist friend who worked for, I um, can't even remember the name of the paper in Kampala now. And he wrote a story about why I was there and what I was intending to do. And then I got lots of copies of the, of the paper and took it with me into the jungle, um, which is right on the border of, you've got Rwanda, Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda. And the town I was in, Kosoro, was right on the uh, border town. And I just gave it to the pygmies, get copies of these to the pygmies and to people that I had roughly employed to help me to take these things and leave them in the villages. Um, so that Interahamwe would find out that I was there and what I was doing. And I just made it known that I was there. Um, and employed locals to go in and get information on whether he was still alive or not and could, could they bring me a cap or something like that to prove that they were... Because, you know, you can never tell who's no. legitimate and who isn't. Well, that's it. I mean, all... But you know sometimes there are little sort of giveaway signs, like I had my satellite phone switched on at, I think it was 4 o'clock every afternoon, and I was staying in this place where, like, the villagers, there was 
ethnic cleansing going on in the villages around me and you know the militia would all of a sudden march through and you'd be there crouched on the ground with your satellite phone trying to do a report and you know there'd be all these guys coming out of the bush with clubs and that 